Okay, in this video, we're going to go over three core AI concepts that you've got to know. It's going to be different than a lot of other intro to AI videos because it doesn't require any machine learning experience. We're also not going to stray away from the technical details, so be sure to stick around. AI is becoming more and more important, even for software engineers, so make sure to master these three concepts. Okay, the first concept is called training. So people talk a lot about models training and learning, but what does that actually mean? Well, first we need to define what a model actually is. The simplest, absolute absolute kind of model is this equation right here. And let's say we're trying to predict how good someone is at beer pong. So you might have played beer pong before. And let's say our model is going to predict someone's win accuracy at the game. And the accuracy is going to be predicted based on three inputs, x1, x2, and x3. Let's say x1 is like your alcohol tolerance, the number of beers you can take before you start slurring your words. And let's say x2 is your general accuracy. So like a number on a scale of one to 10, that actually represents how accurate are you with each throw? And let's say X3 is your trash talking effectiveness. So another number on a scale of one to 10 that kind of represents how good are you at trash talking since obviously that will affect you can get in your opponent's head and it'll overall affect how good you are at the game, right? Your chance of winning. That's what the model is predicting. That's what the value Y represents. But in the equation, we also have these other numbers, right? W1, W2, W3, and B. Those numbers are called the parameters and that actually is the model, right? That's those are the numbers that the model uses to actually make its prediction Y whenever we pass in X1, X2 and X3 for like any arbitrary person. So then what training is, is just finding the right values of those parameters, right? W1 through W3 plus B. It's about finding and updating those values until we're satisfied with the model's prediction Y, until we feel like it's accurate enough. So when we initialize the model, we'll have totally random numbers for W1 through W3, as well as B. But over the course of training this iterative process, we'll be adjusting those values, adjusting the values of the parameters until we actually have an accurate enough model. Okay, but what do those Ws actually represent? So we have like each W multiplied by an X. So let's look at W2, for example, it's multiplied by X2. Each W is actually just factoring in how important each input variable is for determining Y. And if that didn't make sense, let's go over an example. So we have W2 multiplied by X2. So the higher X2 is and the higher W2 are, well, the higher Y is going to be. And we know that X2 was someone's accuracy with each throw in beer pong. And obviously that's pretty important for determining Y, right? The higher the accuracy accuracy of their throws, the higher their probability of winning or their win rate is going to be. So we actually are going to have the model learn over the course of training the right value for W2 because W2 is just factoring in how important X2 is. So over the course of training, let's say we initialize W2 something like negative two, right? Just a random initial value. Well, the model is going to end up learning some much larger positive number for W2 because the higher X2 is, the higher Y should be. So the model is going to actually actually have W2 measure or encapsulate how important X2 is for predicting Y. That's why we're multiplying them together. So that's all training is. Training is just the process of updating the model parameters, which are usually just numbers like W's and B. Those numbers start off totally random, but over the course of training or learning, their values are updated until they actually make sense so that no matter what X1, X2, and X3 are, the model can have like a pretty solidly accurate prediction for what Y should be. So that's all for concept number Number one, training. When we get to concept number three, we're actually going to talk about gradient descent. It's this equation that'll pop up on the screen soon. And that's the actual equation used to update the values of the W's and B. But we don't need to worry about that for now. We'll get to that eventually. All right, on to concept number two. If you made it through concept number one, that's awesome. Try to hang in for the rest of the video because it's going to be a lot easier from here on out. Number two is linear regression. And the good news is we already talked about it in concept number one. This equation that we were talking about, that's linear regression. It's a simple, unsexy model from statistics, but it's actually the foundation of AI. So you've got to understand linear regression. The idea is pretty simple. We're going to have some number of inputs, our X's, and we'll have these W's that we multiply against the X's. We add some number B, and that's how we get the model's prediction Y. And this can work for an example where we have any number of inputs. In our case with beer pong, we had three input attributes, but you could have two input attributes, five input attributes, and the equation would change accordingly. We would have more W's, we would have five W's, 
values, W1 through W5, if we had X1 through X5. So the equation is flexible and it can change accordingly. So linear regression sounds awesome, right? But there is one issue and it's that most data in the world isn't strictly linear. Looking at this equation, it's not going to capture any nonlinear relationships like this one right here right? So that's where neural networks come in. And that brings us to concept number three. Okay, so I know I said we were going to finally talk about the equation gradient descent for training in concept number three. But first, let's actually go over this diagram neural networks. And I think this is going to be one of the simplest explanations you've ever seen. Okay, so to make this neural network explanation much more simpler to understand, we're going to explain it in terms of linear regression. Now, obviously, neural networks are far more powerful than linear regression. The relationships and the data that they can model is are different than simple linear regression models. So I'm going to explain neural networks in terms of linear regression, which is keep in mind that they're not actually identical to linear regression due to non-linear functions like this one, which we'll talk about shortly. But just so anyone doesn't get triggered in the comments, I'm not oversimplifying things or dumbing anything down. We're just going to start off by explaining neural networks in terms of linear regression. Also, if you're actually still watching this video, you're not an NPC. I like you. Let's get into it. So the premise is the same as before. We have x1, we have x2 and we have x3 and those are actually going to be in that first leftmost column which we call the input layer or the input column so there's going to be those same three input attributes and we're ultimately on the right side of the diagram going to actually predict this one number o or y whatever you want to call it that's going to be someone's predicted chance of actually winning a game of beer pong so the same x1 x2 x3 situation as before but what makes neural networks different is that we actually have this column of nodes in the middle right we call that the hidden layer and what we're going to do is simply more linear regression. We're going to let each of those nodes do linear regression and use the equation we talked about earlier, right? This equation, where we're going to have W1 through W3 plus B. We're going to have each of those nodes, each of those nodes in the hidden layer use that equation. So then we're going to get four numbers, Y1 through Y4, all calculated based on the same X1, X2, and X3 from the input layer. So the difference is that each of those four nodes is learning and updating its own set of parameters, its own set of W1, W2, W3, and B. So overall, the model is doing a lot more calculation, which is going to make neural networks far more powerful than linear regression. Of course, there are nonlinearities, which we still have to talk about, but this is also a big part of neural networks. Just the fact that we're having more nodes that are just doing more calculations and more computation as a whole. But we have four numbers right now, Y1 through Y4, and we need to get one final output number. Oh, so this final note is also going to do some more calculation, but it's going to take in four numbers as input. It's going to use this equation right here. It's going to take in y1 through y4, and it's going to learn w1 through w4, as well as again, another constant term b to predict that final output number o. Okay, so that's the gist of neural networks. We just need to talk about nonlinearities. So here is an example of a nonlinearity called the sigmoid function. And just bear with me, we're almost done. Everything's going to make sense. So the sigmoid function right here, we can see that the input could be anything, right? Any number, but the output on the y axis will always be between 0 and 1. So this function is actually transforming any input to be between 0 and 1 in a nonlinear method. And we want to use functions like the sigmoid function in our neural network just so the model can actually capture and learn nonlinear relationships because most data in the real world is not actually the simple linear relationship. So how exactly do we want to incorporate this sigmoid function into the neural network? Well, we want to incorporate it between layers. So after we have the input in a hidden layer, we've done some linear regression, right? We've calculated those numbers y1 through y4, those four numbers. But before we pass those numbers into that final output layer, right? That final output node, we should actually pass y1 through y4, those four numbers each into the sigmoid function to get four different outputs. All of them are going to be between zero and one, just because that's what the sigmoid function does. And those four numbers, the ones between zero and one, the outputs, the outputs from the sigmoid function, that's what we're going to send into that final output node. And this might seem like a small difference, right? Like, okay, what's the big deal? All we've done is incorporated this one weird looking curve into the function. But this is going to drastically change the power of the model. The model is now going to be able to actually pick up on way more complex relationships and nuances in the data. And if that didn't make sense, just leave a comment below. We'll talk about it more in another video. Okay, the video is definitely getting a bit long now. So just to wrap it up, let's come back to gradient descent. It's this equation right here. And it's the actual equation used for 
training, right? To actually update those W's and B at every iteration, there's this equation that depends on the old value for W or B, as well as this other variable alpha, which we'll explain, as well as the derivative. So it might be kind of weird that derivatives from calculus are coming into the picture now, but I promise it won't be any crazy complicated. And for gradient descent, right, this crucial ML algorithm, I actually have a separate video. It should pop up now. It'll be in the description. It'll be in the pinned comment. I put a ton of time into this video, kind of animating exactly how gradient descent works. It's just around three or four minutes long. So definitely check it out next. I honestly would have just included the gradient descent explanation in this video, but just to keep the video from getting too long. So it's actually digestible and not too overwhelming. There's a separate video linked in the description and comment. It should be popping up now too. go ahead and check it out.